Good morning, everybody. Morning. Hello. Uh, my name is Robert Dunlap. I'm the chief of the Wayne County Sheriff's Office, and uh, where I'm responsible for jail and court operations. And uh, just humbled and grateful to be here presenting uh, with uh, my good friend Greg P Paris here of WIT. And uh, Greg, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm good. All right. So. Um, this, this, this work uh, means a lot to me, and I was just up here discussing with Greg how much time do I have, you know, and so, because I can go on and on about it, but I want to start out like this. This project was something that was a long time coming. I've been uh, the chief there now f uh, since 2015. I have over 37 years in law enforcement. Started my career with the Detroit Police Department. I retired from there as the assistant chief, second in charge at the end of 2008, came over to the sheriff's office at the beginning of 2010. And something happened uh, when I got here. Uh, I had an experience where at that time we were averaging about 2,000 people in jail a day. And I was walking through the jail and I saw these guys come into jail and they were actually booking themselves in the jail. What does that mean? You know, and you know, you you laugh, and I, I was kind of shocked. I was, the guy comes in, he goes, he rolls his fingerprint, he stands in front of the camera, shh, then walks out, and he puts himself in a cell. And I asked the lieutenant, I said, hey, what is that? She said, that's what we call a frequent flyer. I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, they've been here quite a few times. I said, ah, something's wrong with that. Well, fast forward a little bit. Um, we, uh, uh, after seeing that, uh, I wanted to know more about it. So real briefly about Wayne County. Wayne County, as you know, is the largest county in the state of Michigan. Uh, the Wayne County Jail, too, is the largest jail system in the state of Michigan. And this is just kind of a, a graphic to give you some perspective about population in Wayne County as well as the uh, 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 number, of number of beds for the jails. And you can see our population, 17, uh, 1.7 million, almost 1.8. We have almost 3,000 jail beds, but very soon that's going to change, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. I'm cautiously optimistic. We're going to go from three separate facilities down to one which is kind of my next slide. So this is kind of how we're situated right now. We have three facilities with today, we have probably, I didn't look at the population today, we've been trending at about 1,430 uh, in custody daily with another uh, 1,250 on electronic monitoring, tether, community supervision. Uh, and right now they're spread between two jails. Jail Division One, Jail Division Two, because the third jail that you saw in the photo, we have uh, pretty much uh, shut down adult operations there, and we allow the county to bring the youth there, uh, the juvenile detention center, which is not under the Wayne County Sheriff, by the way. So, we have two people in two old downtown jails: Shawshank, built in 1929, and a newer Podular Indirect. At the end of 2023, we're building a 2,280-bed uh, facility at Warren and Mack, supposed to be state-of-the-art facility. Uh, one of the things that I'm op optimistic about is going to bring three separate and desperate jail systems under one. And you know what happens when you have people working in three locations? You have kind of three cultures. And so I'm excited about uh, us bringing it together and uh, galvanizing into that one uh, culture. Prior to me meeting uh, the good folks here at WIT and the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, every day in the Wayne County Sheriff's Office, at least since 2015 when I started, I have an officer come to work and literally go through the computer and count and see how many people are in the jail and they would produce 
a hard flat file report like this that they would scan and email to everyone. And so at that time, we're processing roughly 1,800 people a day. And I think all of you can just about imagine the time that it takes for one person to count all of those people. And then if you look at this, separate them by jails, because that one person had to count for all three jails, even though they're in one location. And so that's taken three, four hours for one person to do. And uh, you might imagine that uh, when you're just counting, sometimes you don't see people. And, and that's the crux of, I wanted to start out by actually, why do you do what you do if it doesn't benefit others? Even though you might be in data and technology, hopefully on this earth, our desire is to, to uh, not only you know, make life good for ourselves, but those that we love, and others that we share this earth with. And so the problem that we had was, uh, I told you about that one, in the, the, those individuals that was booking themselves in the jail. Well, just another short story. Uh, when I became the chief, we used some jail inmates to set up my office to move furniture. Five of them moved the furniture. The next day I bought lunch so they didn't eat the jail food. And I sat and had lunch with them in a small conference. They said, hey, tell me more. Why are you in jail? And they said, oh, I'm just here on a misdemeanor. What kind of misdemeanor? I just got traffic tickets. I said, no, you're not in jail for just traffic tickets. Oh, yeah, yeah, I am. So I had staff to go check. Now, it took a couple of hours to go check the computer, so I didn't get the information till the next day. They were all telling the truth. They were just there for traffic tickets. Couldn't believe it. I'm like, wait a minute. We got murderers, rapers, and robbers. We got people in jail for traffic tickets, 30 days. And so one of the things that uh, uh, stuck out to me was, wow, this is something that I should be able to see right up front. But I had to have a couple of staff members go through the data manually through our computers, because, yeah, we have computers, and then sort by charge and figure this out. Well, I shared this information at a conference uh, back in 2017. Our friends from the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network was there, uh, which is kind of our public health authority in Wayne County. And uh, the director approached me, she says, Chief, I heard your story and it's sad that you got people in the jail, booking themselves in the jail. They're on misdemeanors. What can I do to help? And I said, well, I'm not sure what you can do to help, but we need to find a better way to identify these people that are there just because of a misdemeanor before they ultimately do something and become a felony. Stop the cycle recidivism. She said, hey, I'm working with a company called WIT. And I'm like, WIT? What is that? And so she introduced me to Kayed and Greg, and we had a conversation about my challenges. And... Because we have a relationship, we uh, put, we integrated jail data with the health authority data. And one of the reasons for doing that, I wanted to find, you know, just a little more information about them because we often hear in public that people, uh, there's an over-incarceration of mentally ill and that's the challenge for law enforcement across the country. Well, this was our first stab at it, the first stabs. And what we learned was in our system, and we looked at all data from the very beginning when we started uh, uh, collecting data in the sheriff's office electronically forward to at that time, 2019. And so what we found is we had over 100,000 unique individuals in our system who was responsible for over 400,000 bookings over the course of time. So that means a lot of them have been booked multiple times and for multiple offenses. Well, the telling part of it was when you look at this 100,000 individuals, we have highlighted a circle in red, 96,000 also had a misdemeanor and 92,000 had a felony. Some had both, a felony and a misdemeanor. Well. 
what we did then, I says, hey, maybe this is a good project for us. Let's work with the low-hanging fruit, and let's see how many people have come to the jail just for a misdemeanor only, traffic misdemeanor only. And so uh, in doing that, we found in, I think it was 2018, Greg, that we looked at all bookings for 20, uh, 2018, and we sorted out just those people that were arrested on misdemeanor only. And we found of the people that was arrested for the first time, and it was a traffic misdemeanor, there was about 1,700 of them out of 25,000 people that were booked. And of that 1,700 who had their first arrest ever, shockingly, 82% of them were registered consumers with our mental health authority. And so what that told me is a lot of these people had some type of either narcotic addiction or mental health issue that was also a, uh, contributing to uh, their coming back and forth to the jail, not being able to find a job to help them stay out of the jail. And because I didn't have the proper technology and system, it was hard for us to address that. What did I say earlier? When you just process numbers, sometimes you don't see people. And that's what we were doing. We were processing the process, and we weren't seeing the people like I saw those five individuals that moved my office. But for that experience, they would have just been another number, correct? So unbeknownst to us, uh, as we talked about this, and I said to the team at WIT, I said, hey, I'd like to have a dashboard where I can see at a glance what is going on in the jail. How many people booked in today? What are their charges? Which of them have health issues? Which of them don't? Which are felonies and misdemeanors? So I can make decisions real timely. And if I see I have a large portion of misdemeanors, then we can drill down and see if we can help them. And so unbeknownst to us at that time, there was a foundation called Hudson Weber. They had uh, impaneled a study through a uh, group called the Vera Group, and they had asked them to take a look at jails in Southeast Michigan to help them understand the problem with the over-incarceration of people who are poor, people of color, uh, uh, minorities, and because th their mission is to focus on deterring crime and reducing it through reducing recidivism, recidivism and creating jail diversions. That, that's their mission and focus in order to create safe and just communities, and then also by strengthening their relationship with law enforcement. But we didn't know right then that they had impaneled this study until maybe a year later they invited us to a meeting and I invited Kayette and Greg to come along with us because we knew the work we had did already. We just didn't have a dashboard. And what did the Vera Group say? They said, well, Wayne County, like a lot of other counties across the country, are arresting people for what we call financial crimes. They don't have the money to pay to get out and they're languishing in jail because they don't have $500 bond. You know, over incarceration of people with misdemeanors, non-assaultive type offense. Now felonies, so for those of you that don't know, a felony is usually something that gets you prison time if you're found guilty. Murder, rape, robbery, assault. Misdemeanor can be something as simple as uh, you get loud and disorderly on the sidewalk, you get a ticket. That, that's a misdemeanor offense. Or, uh, or driving with a uh, suspended license, or not even a suspended license. There was a time if you left your license at home, that's a misdemeanor arrestable traffic offense. And so what we knew already is when Hudson Weber did this presentation, I looked at him and said, we already know that because of the work that we had done with D. Wynn and Witt. Uh, we were able to see the number one reasons people come to the jail. You probably can't see it from where you are, but I'm going to just shout out a few. Operating with no license. 
operating without a license, multiple license, uh, no insurance. How many people in the urban city don't have car insurance? Uh, ordinance violation, that's the got loud on the street. Or here's another one, you're drinking beer on the sidewalk, that's a ticket. A misdemeanor, 90-day arrestable. Uh, unregistered vehicle. Uh, and now I'm not saying that people should be allowed to just do these things, but I think we'll all agree. Here's the one that I, I want to point out. I don't see trespassing on here. Trespassing, I'm going to talk more about that a little later. But I think we'll agree that no one should spend 30, 90 days in a jail because they left their license at home and they had so many tickets. Well, a lot of that was happening, and we knew, and we were trying to do something about it. But the good thing is, Hudson Weber, after the Vera study, said, hey, what can we do? And that's when it happened for us. I said, well, let's take the information and the work that we did with WIT and present it to Hudson Weber and see if they'll fund the jail dashboard. And that's how uh, we got funded for our project to build the first ever dashboard for a jail in the state of Michigan, we believe. If you go online right now, www.sheriffconnect.com, you'll see the Wayne County Sheriff's Dashboard where you can get uh, information about how many people's in jail, who's in jail, what they're in jail for, if they're in a mental health bed, if they're in general population, uh, uh, misdemeanor charges. The things that I said took my staff a day and a half, two days to do. Now it's available at the click of the button because of the work that we had already done. And then me coming to wit saying, hey, these are the things that I need to see in a dashboard. And so I'd share with them. Uh, I saw a dashboard in Larimer County, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and we just didn't have the funds until uh, Hudson Weber had Vera do the study. And Vera told Hudson Weber and the rest of the county what we already knew. And so the demographics that I needed to see is all of what I just shared with you. Uh, let me see, where are we, Greg? Uh, OK, so th this is the point where we you know, transition. And Greg can tell you more about the work that you all do behind the scenes to make it possible for us to see it at a glance. But I want to just kind of remind you what I said at the start. Uh, I truly believe in my heart that I don't care what you do in life. If it only benefits you, then what good is it? And certainly in law enforcement, uh, our goal should be not just to arrest people and throw them away. But true reform can only happen when you can see the individual behind the issue. And I'll end with my portion with this. Right now, there's an individual in my jail who has been there now about a month. And no, three weeks. He has been to the jail every year since 2010. He's 32 years old. And he's in jail right now for trespassing. 32, been there every year. Not one time has he been arrested for a felony or assault of type offense. And it was brought to my attention through now this huge partnership and collaboration that we built off the work that we did with WIT. WIT. Now we have Wayne State involved. We have our chief judge of a criminal court and probate court involved. And we meet monthly and sometimes twice a month to just look at the jail population, who's there, because we can all see it at a glance, why they're there, and who should be in treatment opposed to being in jail. Well, this individual that's in the jail right now, uh, I just had a conversation with the jail health team and told him this time when he when he's, he won't be released without me getting notified first, because I want to make sure that even though he's been released to treatment before, there's a gap. Something is happening why this guy keeps coming back. And what I discovered, I had staff to talk to him. He can communicate long enough 
for a traffic stop on a traffic stop for an officer to think he's normal. But after about 20 minutes, he started to decline. He gets irritable and starts repeating himself. Most police stops only about 10 or 15 minutes. The rest are gone. And I don't know what his diagnosis is exactly, but I do know that he has been committed before. But what didn't happen is someone didn't check to see, well, when he gets out of treatment, who's going to help him navigate? And so I'm going to get involved and make sure that if he doesn't have an adult family member, we're going to petition the court to find a guardian because this is the individual that we don't need to see become a felony. And so uh, a lot of this wouldn't have been possible where I, the chief, would be able to stop and see this without the help and the work, the support of people like Witt and Dee Wynn and the fruition of our dashboard project. And so Greg is going to tell you more about the behind the scenes work that went into bringing it together. Thank you, Chief. So um, we did what we normally do, and uh, we looked around at some of the best practices for other dashboards. Uh, we, we hit on one that we kind of agreed that it would be a good quality one to emulate. And uh, we kind of tore it apart and see what data we already have. And uh, for example, in Larimer, they have homeless, uh, they collect information about whether you're homeless when you go into the jail. It's something that definitely the chief wanted to, to say, that's a, that's a good uh, thing, to, an, an ideal to collect, but we don't currently. Um, and so we, we tried to do you know, minimal viable product of conversion of what is existing and then to layer on and add to uh, that possible um, set of collections of requirements. So we hit on, these are the high points, the, the major subject areas. Uh, we took a lot from what was existing at Larimer, but we also added on uh, things that, um, that uh, are unique to Wayne County and the uh, data that they have. Uh, we engineered um, essentially um, their jail management system data collects around individuals and their, uh, their charges, their bookings. There's a hierarchy where the charges go up to bookings. Um, and uh, we, we used that information, and what we found was that their infrastructure was already built. They already have a, 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 a contractor supplying them with the software needed to collect the data. We just needed a way in, uh, a mechanism out to report, and in the analytics community, we're always looking for building a data mart before we go into the visualization side. And so we were able to do that through um, their reporting SQL server already. Um, they used uh, a specific coding language called Web Focus. Um, we decided to focus on not that, but on SQL, uh, because that was already available also. Uh, and it also allowed us a clean entry and exit into uh, a visualization. Uh, we did some more work around the SQL Server side. So we did the ETL process uh, necessary on top of their existing systems and their networking. And we were able to pipe out. And they have a, they have a great website that they already uh, build, uh, that it was already built in WordPress, and we decided to find a way in which to connect directly into that um, and build, that, build this out. Um, challenges around this is that uh, Wayne County is, they don't have a lot of resources for uh, building these type of tools, and uh, Hudson Weber came in and helped with that, but they also wanted low cost maintenance around this, so we built existing systems and added to that. Our value add was a low cost product that could easily produce this on a daily basis. Um, so they don't have a lot of cost from this project. Their SQL servers are already paid for, licensed. Their infrastructure is already paid for. The only add was this other visualization tool that, we, that was pretty low cost. It's called the Infogram. And Infogram will create um, charts and graphs really quickly off of the data that you supply it to. And it plugs in to WordPress pretty well. So um, this is the website that we created. I'm going to jump over there. Um, it's uh, built out in their WordPress uh, mechanism. Uh, I think there we go. Oh, it's working. Um, it's um, pretty kind of like a, a kind of like a snazzy way in which to present. It like builds out visually. Uh, these are pretty simple line graphs, uh, but the uh, categorization at the top line of bookings, inmates to bookings, to housing, to releases, is something that um, 
kind of um, matured in how we saw from other websites and we also saw in the data itself. Um, so in terms of population, they can look at the daily population. So they have a daily population and look back the last 30 days. Um, who, who's on, in jail and also this other mechanism of who's in, on tether or uh, EMU. Hmm. That's probably, I need to escape out the PowerPoint. Uh, Achilles. So I join that. I just want to share with you uh, the outcome of this. Huh. I told you earlier that our population is averaging 1,800, 2,000. Now we're averaging about 1,400. There we go. Okay, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good story because it changed some outcomes across the state. Agreed. Um, it is a really good story. Um, the, the process changed, especially it was impacted by COVID, and the, the impact uh, was not all that negative uh, in terms of uh, jail population and also the use of tether. Uh, they increased it dramatically. Um, so we can look at the last 30 days. We can look at um, min-max uh, current average. Um, we have uh, you know, charts for both jail solely, uh, who are in jail, but also the uh, view into the tether or EMU, I think is it. Electronic monitoring community supervision. That one. Um, and looking at average monthly, and um, this is very helpful for you know, reporting of any kind is uh, standardized mechanisms of daily, monthly, weekly, um, and yearly. Uh, and, you know, simple stats or demographics uh, like the number of males to females, um, the population is 90 to 9 to 1. Um, and um, it's also like on tether, it's a little bit different. It's uh, a little bit higher in terms of female on tether. And then the divisions and how the divisions break out. Um, age, as you can think uh, about if you've uh, been exposed to the criminal justice background stuff, youth tends to drive up in terms of uh, the number of people in, in jail and under what's called supervision. Um, and definitely there's a larger segment of the 18 to 25 and then the decline over time. Uh, in terms of age, um, and it mimics both in tether and and jail. This is a big differentiation because uh, it's usually the nonviolent offenders who are offered this sense of tether, means uh, uh, at home uh, supervision, um, and this was really important to uh, the management of the jail. Usually, usually, um, you know how. Uh, the race and ethnicity, um, and uh, both in jail and tether, normal differentiation. Um, and what's interesting is that a lot of this um, was, uh, you know, collected over time. Uh, but we also saw a, a fair amount of other and uh, unknowns. Um, data is poor at times. Uh, collection is poor. It's relying on people to be the data to be collected at point of entry. Um, and we also found you know, some gaps in ways in which the data is presented. And we were able to feed that back in and have some of that cleaned up. Um, so this is the big nexus for us as an organization. We're, we're connected to DWIN, which is a, a, a mental health, uh, substance abuse, uh, public health oriented organization. And what we brought to the table was really a focus on that the nexus between these two populations. Um, this is data uh, directly out of the JMS system about um, mental health and um, mental health consumers, both in jail, and this is consumption in the sense of like those people who have identified um, in the jail system uh, by um, uh, when they've been uh, evaluated. What we found uh, with our connection to DWIN though is that the percentage is low comparatively to what is in reality um, the ex uh, membership in the others. So when we crossed over the two populations, we actually found that a lar much larger percentage. Um, and the most critical is this length of stay. 
And evaluating length of stay is how long somebody's been in jail, how long they've been on tether. And this has changed over uh, the last three years. It's gotten longer. Um, and um, the reasons for that are multiple, uh, but under COVID, the length of stay, and you can see, um, is, is increased um, to the point where those greater than 730 year, uh, days, um, that's, that's two years, um, is, is actually quite large. And as the chief will mention many times, is that uh, if you're not sentenced, if you're waiting for trial and you're incarcerated uh, for a long period of time, this is a, a larger burden on you, uh, both financially and also on financially on the county. Um, and the length of stay at times is quite long. Um, and that's just the um, uh, uh, inmates. The actual, the booking side of that um, uh, is, is whether, you know, the input side. So we're analyzing the input side um, and we can analyze that uh, through the last seven days, um, the last year, and the break by gender, the pivot against that. And this was important to sh see for the, de the massive decline uh, because the policies around this has been really um, adapting to COVID and to the exigencies around COVID. Um, um, so. and I'll do this pretty quickly. Misdemeanor felony, uh, what's the, the break? You can see that the misdemeanors um, and felonies are-, are That's an important slide to see. If you notice that probably 80% of our jail now, 85, is all felony. Before this, it was more 60-40. And so that's one of the outcomes. As Greg has explained, COVID obviously exploded the length of stay, not just in one county, but across the country. And so now the courts are coming back. We expect to see that go down. But more importantly, the populations are going down as well because we have more information about who's in jail. And, oh, I'm sorry. We have more information about who's in jail and we're better able to identify what other services they may need to keep them out. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to share, uh, this information that we share, we share with the state. Uh, you may remember the governor announced the jail diversion task force and a lot of the information that they use to change some of how we uh, process misdemeanors in the state came off of the data that we share because no one should be in the jail simply because they have a mental illness. And so uh, just two weeks ago, there was an announcement statewide of what is called automatic set aside. And so if you ever was arrested for one of those 90 day misdemeanors because you left your license at home or like you were drinking on the sidewalk, that's a criminal conviction. Because of the work that we did and we shared, that's no longer in the state of Michigan. Those have been automatically expunged. And you know, uh, I, I, I don't drink beer, but some people that might, they'll be getting a letter in the mail from their local police department saying, hey, I need you to come in. We need to fingerprint you because your charge 10 years ago from drinking on the sidewalk has been expunged from your record. So I, th I think the, um, what may be the, uh, the goal of this project was to ease the burden of the reporting by the Wayne County Jail and allow for greater communication with the partners and with the public. And this is really a, a, a nice first step into that publicness, transparency, getting the data out, allowing people to see it and allow people to understand it. Um, but also, you know, uh, I think for the, the organization itself, it's that connective tissue to other partners to get really a conversation going with the courts, with the DWIN, with the state, um, to really get uh, and allow that conversation to happen, as well as on the backside, and really what the, we've done over time, is that the, there's an internal side that is always more powerful. There's always a dashboard or a product that you can do internally faster, but th at least this allows for that open conversation and um, an ability to kind of look at it in general. Um, I think this, this has really been a, a good first step. 
Um, we're looking for advancing it and improving it, phase two. Uh, we're looking to get to the point where, and this is the, the interesting thing about jail data in general, I think, is this, um, is that they already had published, um, they published the names of everybody in jail. They um, allow you to look at who's in jail. And um, this is important because there's an ability for um, micro and actually drilling in. And this is what we built off of in some ways. One? Can I do one? Yeah, go ahead. I want to show them the misdemeanor guy real quick that I just talked about. It's public information. And I wasn't really prepared for this is that, um, you know, there's the, um, these are published um, uh, data about what I would on the health side would think is HIPAA data. But it's on, on, the, on the jail side, it's not because of uh, the crime and offense on that side. Um, See what I mean? I wanted to show you that he's in jail for ordinance. He's in jail for a ticket because he was just in the wrong place. You know why he was there? Because he's not conscious of where he's at. And the officers weren't able to understand it. And so now because of this technology, because of this tool, we can work with him. And we're going to make sure that when he leaves, at least I'm going to do my best to make sure that he's connected not only to treatment but a provider. And so the probate, chief probate court judge is working with us on this as well as several other partners. So that's the beauty of this. Before, I couldn't do this. I'd have to have someone go pull the manual file and we go through it. And how much time does that take? So um, the lift was at the macro level, and then we were able to kind of get to the, the micro level also. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the aspects of this dashboard we'd like to improve is ability to filter, ability to get back and forth between the micro and macro. Uh, right now, we've got this high level now, and we also have the lowest level, but there's a, a, a little connectivity between the two. And I'll take questions. Yeah, go ahead. So the question is about uh, whether we received any pushback on the release of the data or, or the, um, the, the website in general, the, the dashboard. Yeah, so that's the one challenge in law enforcement, you know, being able to get information about people that have health issues. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out across the country. The reason we were able to do the project here is because we have a relationship with our health authority where they fund services in the jail for inmates. And so we weren't sharing information with someone that we didn't already have a relationship with and vice versa. Okay. And, in, and in terms of the, the data that seems to be at the point where you, you it crosses that line into your health um, information, uh, we tried to uh, not allow drill in. Um, wasay has got to tell them. Oh. Uh, Chief, I have a question. You built this for knowledge of what's going on in your jails. Have you uh, got any feedback from other customers who are using this data? And is there like a back and forth of information of how you're changing it? Yeah, a lot of uh, the uh, community partners uh, use it all the time to just kind of see what's going on in the jail. Uh, and, and a lot of them to see how they can help us. Um, one. Uh, one of them, the media, we hear from the media all the time, FOIA requests. They want to know how many people in jail, what are they in jail for? And it's like, we don't have the time or the manpower to give you that. Guess what? You can go right there now. It's public information. Run it for yourself. So uh, we haven't gotten a lot of calls from, well, let me back up a little bit. We also, after this project, just launched another project in Wayne County where now we're sharing our tether information with every police department in Wayne County. And so we just completed the uh, uh, memorandum of agreement for them to sign just two days ago. We did a training uh, about three weeks ago. And what that is, those police departments will be able to see in real time exactly who's on supervision on tether 
wherever they are across 679 square miles in Wayne County without going through us. And so that the genesis for that sharing uh, came out of the spirit of building this dashboard. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so I had a question about um, stakeholders in this. So you've shown really important relationships between uh, the mental health and misdemeanors and recidivism and the shift from jailing to electronic monitoring. Um, are you presenting this to like prosecutors and judges? Are, you know, how, how is that uh, put in the hands of people that can make those changes? So his question was, are we sharing this information with prosecutors and judges? And that's kind of where Greg was going, where we want to go with our second phase. And some people say, well, Chief, that's bold. Because I want the public to be able to drill down and see how long these people have been in the jail and why they've been in jail so long and what judge is responsible for the case. Now, the Constitution say you're entitled to a speedy trial. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to get into that. You know, people say, well, it's 180 days. Well, there's a lot of things that happen in between that time that extends it. But you should be able to look and see if those things are taking place. And the chief judge of the court should, will be able to look at this and see how other judges in the court are managing their dockets. And so they are fully aware of it. Uh, as Greg mentioned earlier, during COVID, we work directly every week with our Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy, Chief Judge Tim Kinney, with this information and share, and, and that's how we work to decide who's gonna get a compassionate release. Uh, but the, the dashboard wasn't fully built. We were doing a lot of it manually. And so the answer is yes. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering what kind of data are you hope I apologies if you already uh, did this in your presentation, but what kind of data are you hoping to add to the dashboard? Um, I was thinking about like recidivism rates, maybe historical data past 30 days. But yeah, I was just curious about what's, what you might be adding to the dashboard. So in the second phase, we do want to add more mental. So the mental health that you're seeing here, those are people flagged by us. We're not qualified to say that these people are mentally ill. But we know that there's something going on. And so Greg mentioned earlier that the DWIN database on mental illness had a lot more people in it because those people are the ones that have been officially diagnosed and documented. The people in the jail, uh, we do have doctors, a full staff of doctors and nurses in our jail. We're the largest inpatient mental health facility in the state. but. I want to just caution you that you see it, those are flags by us, untrained staff, uh, but they do get a designation once the medical staff confirm, yeah, they, they need treatment. Other data that we want to add is just what I said. You know, how is this case progressing through the court? What judge is managing the case? Is there a, uh, is he still here or she still here? because there's a motion that needs to take place. There's a whole lot of processes, uh, uh, events that happen that causes a person to be in the jail for say six to nine months before they ever go to trial. You can't see that in the dashboard. Hopefully in the second phase, you'll be able to see that information and you'll also be able to see if the person was maybe even released to treatment. Thanks very much, um, and we'll, we're open for questions after, um, but that's the wrap-up of uh, Can I ask, Kaya, do you have anything that I left out that, please, uh, Kaya, would you add just, I know you always have one thing, because uh, he was very involved with this. Yeah, no, thank you, Chief. There are not that many chiefs out there in the country who, who, who think and, and, and believe in data so much and, and do things like that. But one of the things I know Chief always mentioned to me right from the beginning was the cost of jailing somebody. You know, and that's the one factor I think you missed, Chief, is that yeah. uh, I think you mentioned when we first met, it was $160 per night, which is I think more than what we pay for Holiday Inn. And, um, and I think that is cost to the taxpayers. And so what uh, this dashboard and all the Chief's work is doing is I think reducing 
the burden to the taxpayer as well. So we should not forget that part as well. It's, it's good for everybody. Thank you, and I, I'm glad I did that because a good story, we were spending about $30 million a year incarcerating people because they didn't have their license. And so I'm glad I asked them to tell me what I left out. We're saving the county right now with the people on Tether over $80 million a year. Thank you. Thank you.